and good evening to everybody. Um, before we get started, I wanted to introduce NOMA's stroll coordinator and in Wood's own Martin Collins, uh, who has a special statement to kick us off tonight. Martin, you're up. Thank you, Nuria. Uh, tonight's sponsor is Saggio. Saggio is a 10-year-old Italian restaurant. They're located at 827 West 181st Street between Pinehurst Avenue and Cabrini Boulevard. Saggio's is known for their delicious Southern Italian cuisine. At this time, Saggio is open 4 to 9 p.m. every day for takeout. And you can check out Saggio's menu on Instagram, Saggio NYC, and on their website, SaggioNYC.com. And we are very grateful to, and thanks Saggio for sponsoring tonight's Stay at Home Open Studio Tour with Rose DeLaw. Miriam, back to you. <laughs> thank you so much, Martin, and thanks to Sagios for your support. And thanks to all of you for being here tonight. It's so, and I see some of you are ready to, for a cocktail uh, uh, studio visit. Uh, it's so nice to see so many of you returning tonight. And then to all of you new visitors, welcome, welcome, welcome. And we hope you'll come back. Um, my name is Neria Leva Gutierrez, and I am Acting Executive Director of Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance. And again, we are thrilled here at NOMA to present our third in a series of virtual open studio tours with Uptown Artists every Thursday night at 7.30. Um, and as I've mentioned, as of so, and as so many of you already know, open studios with local artists are a Noma Arts Stroll fixture. Um, and so we are still so excited that we can bring these um, wonderful visits to you virtually. Um, before I introduce tonight's fantastic artists, I wanted to mention that tonight's program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. And of course, we remain grateful for their support. Um, programs like these, as all of you know, really depend on this kind of support. And I think we can all agree that these programs are ever more important during these incredibly isolating and uncertain times. Um, and to that point, it bears reminding that we would like to ask each of you uh, to stick around um, at the end and answer our poll, which will now, uh, thanks to Michelle, pop up on your screens at the end of the evening so that we can continue improving and enhancing our programming. Um, also, again, please sign up for our weekly newsletters and e-blasts where we detail all of the exciting things that we're doing and all of the things that our partners are doing in Upper Manhattan um, as well. Um, those are usually published on Tuesday. And again, as always, we encourage you to reach out to us, to email us, to contact us. We love hearing from you. Um, but now uh, I'd like to move on to our main event uh, and I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, a resident artist of Washington Heights, Rose Deler, holds an MFA in studio arts from the City College of New York and has exhibited her work widely in galleries in New York City and across the country. Most recently, her work was featured in NOMA's Women in the Heights exhibition, uh, a show she has participated in many times before and we are better for it. Uh, she serves as an adjunct faculty member at City College where she teaches intro to ceramics and she is the recipient of numerous prizes such as the Provost Prize in Art, the Holly T. Popper Award and the Merritt Connor Tuition Scholarship. As we will see and as we will hear tonight, Deleuze's work is craft based or as she has described women's work. But it's a women's work that at once considers ideals, ideas related to feminist empowerment and that thoughtfully reference her ancestors who were boat builders, carpenters, seamstresses, farmers, and homemakers. In her work, which brings together textiles, sewing, ceramic, and printmaking, and photography, Deler delves deep into the labor and process of art making and craft connecting her hand and mind. She explores themes related to memory and time, present and passing, and to larger universals as what is true, what is painful, what is happy. As she herself has stated, she makes and then tries to understand why. 
And so to help us learn about her why, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rose Belair. Rose? Oh my goodness, what an introduction. Thank you so much, Nira. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. And um, this is a little strange for me because usually I'm in my place, uh, people coming through here for open studio. So, um, but I guess what, what, what's the saying? Necessity is the mother of invention or, and, or the need to learn new things like this technology stuff um, that we've been thrusted into. Like, I was going kicking and screaming, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, but here we are, you know, we got to stay connected, and I am so happy, I mean, um, I have to say that NOMA has been instrumental in my growth as an artist, and uh, when we moved up here about, I don't know, maybe about 13 years ago, to find this it took me a while to find Noma, but what I did, I found my place as an artist within a community. And I was blown away of how many brilliant artists are in uh, Upper Manhattan. And, you know, Brooklyn's got nothing on us. So up near Uptown New York is where it's at. And I'm really proud to be a, uh, an artist in, uh, in Upper Manhattan. Um, yeah, I just did a quick little film. It'll give you a little rundown of my studio and some of the stuff that I'm working on. I can't hear it. Minutes, I will give you a brief tour of my space, tell you about my process in art making, and demonstrate how I slip cast a Barbie dress form for a collection I've been building since late 2018. My studio is in the cellar of an 1898 townhouse in the Morris Jamel Historic District of Washington Heights in Northern Manhattan. It has all the trappings of a basement. There is no natural light and it is filled with things from my husband's pool table to my dad's carpentry tools, as well as bits and pieces of stuff that I've collected for an ever-increasing list of things I want to make. The place has poor ventilation, it's gritty, and it's hard to keep clean. However, with all its shortcomings, I feel incredibly blessed to have this space. I have converted the pool table into my sewing table with a sheet of plywood and a cutting mat. The table saw doubles as a workbench for woodworking and metal smithing. There's an old sink I got off Craigslist, followed by a space reserved for my messy ceramics work. Inside the mechanical room where we house the water heater and the furnace is my little kiln that fires to cone six. On any given day in my studio, you will see works in progress, experiments and trials, as well as completed works waiting to be displayed in some exhibit or to travel to a new home. As the daughter of a carpenter and seamstress, I am most interested in the labor of art making. Craft is the underpinning and the foundation of what I make. In her essay, Making and Naming, Anna Fariello states, the essence of craft is bound to the hand, to the process of working and making. Craft is a point on the line of material expression, embracing more than just art or design, but also the execution. Fariello adds that craft is the archaeological evidence of an action taken by the maker. The object is also a document. My work must bear the mark of my mind as well as my hand. This is the freedom to think and make, to change direction or approach as I go along. It is instant and it is fluid from my head to my hands. There's no need for sketches or explanations or directions. It is private until it is not. My process is visceral. I create and then I try to understand why. The inspirations come from many places. It could be the remnant of a fabric or cloth that is draped in a particular way when it catches my eye or the thought that challenges me. I bet you can make this lump of clay into a wearable piece of clothing. It could also be the need to make something that I otherwise cannot afford or a deep desire to express my thoughts of what is happening in the world around me. I'm inspired by the vernacular artist's approach to art making. Bessie Harvey, for instance, pulled out roots from her yard and quote unquote breathed life into them with paint, yarn, 
and wobbly plastic eyes. Sam Rodia, without the benefit of any formal ed architectural training or education, built the Watts Tower in Los Angeles, which have withstood elements and time. I am stirred by their desire and drive to make. Undaunted, they figure things out. They don't know the rules and so anything is possible. In the remote town of Gee's Bend, Alabama, young girls were given a needle and thimble and taught to quilt by their mothers and grandmothers. It was a way to pass the time as well as learn a skill that they can use to make something out of nothing. The quilts emerged from a need to stay warm in the unheated cabins. The G's Bend quilts are works of art. To the vernacular artist, art is a way of life. They remind me of my parents who did not have the benefit Mother's of academia, ground. but nonetheless are artists in their own right. Vernacular artists move me to go beyond what I know to experiment, to create, to make. Inspired by the whimsical work of ceramic artist Brett Kern, I became interested in slip casting, a ceramic forming technique for the mass and production of pottery, especially for shapes not Noma, easily made on a wheel. Did, With no intention of mass production, but more as a starting point to create collections. Playing with dolls is a series of Madame Alexander dolls cast in white clay with hairstyles my sisters, friends, and I sported as youngsters. Names like Rolo, Depridu, Colita, and Monito, each sculpture also wears an asabache to ward off the evil eye. They speak of my Dominican heritage. The second collection and the one where I will demonstrate the slip casting technique is called Where are Frida Kahlo's Brows? After seeing Mattel's Frida Kahlo Barbie doll, with the long neck, thin arms, light color eyes and skin, the unauthentic Mexican dress, and missing her trademark unibrow, I was disappointed and kind of slightly pissed. I began to slip cast Barbie torsos and distort them as a quiet rebellion. When I first began this project, I had to make a mold out of this Barbie doll dress form. The mold I made is out of a uh, plaster of Paris. Once my plaster of Paris had cured, I was able to open it, remove my form, and I was left with this negative space. And it's in this negative space that I will be pouring in the slip. Slip is liquid clay um, or tiny particles of clay that happens that are suspended in water. Um, I stir my slip really well, and then I sift it into this pitcher, into whatever pitcher, through a strainer to make sure that there aren't any lumps or bumps that are left behind um, and that can ruin my cast. I uh, wrap this bounding uh, strap around, and um, this will keep my back side, the back side of the mold and the front side of the mold nice and tight uh, so, so that the... Um, Slip for it doesn't slip uh, up the sides. <laughs> Okay, if it overflows, what starts to happen now is that the plaster begins to absorb the water that's inside the liquid clay, and layer starts forming inside my negative on, on, on the negative space inside my mold, and eventually. I've timed it already, so I know that if I leave it like this for about five minutes, spill out the clay, the liquid clay that's left, I have the thickness that I want. That's just, that was just a matter of trial and error, how long to wait. So now I'll wait for about five minutes, and then I'll come back and I'll spill this out. So it's a little over five minutes, and I'm back to um, spill the clay, the residual slip that's in here. I have this tray that I'm going to use, and I also have a little, um, I guess, paintbrush. So I'm going to just kind of make sure that I maintain a um, open, because my hole is kind of small, and sometimes when you're trying to get really thick stuff out of a small hole, um, air has to go in in order for the liquid to flow out. So 
how my clay will spill out. Right now the, the walls are about the thickness that I like. And I'm gonna let this sit for maybe another half hour so that the um, clay could set inside my shape and um, let it drip in there. And I'll be back and I'll show you a reveal of my slip casted Barbie doll dress form. So it's been about half an hour, so we're going to try to open this up. enough it should pop up oh, there we go quite nicely and there is my Barbie doll torso body form dress form um, I'll wait a little longer let it set up a little more and then I'll just remove these little fettles on the side and that's where the back of the mold meets the front of the mold it leaves these this little um, extra slip on there clay and I can just take a little uh, knife and um, remove them as well as the top. And then I'll just kind of put it uh, aside for a while and um, wait until I'm inspired to adore it. And that is how I cast a Barbie torso for my collection, Where is Frida Kahlo's Brows. <laughs> Well, Rose, I know you said that you were kicking and screaming, you didn't want to do this, um, <laughs> that you were unsure, and that you were just going to do a quick little film. I think we can all agree um, that you uh, were made to do this. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, and it was so nice to, to really uh, see the demonstration uh, to get a sense of how the slip casting is done. So thank you so much for that. Um, I know that there are um, probably many questions for you. Uh, so we'd like now to open up the floor um, to questions uh, from our virtual audience. Um, and so what we'd like uh, to encourage you all to do is to start um, writing your questions into the chat feature uh, that is, uh, should be on uh, the bottom part of your screen. Um, and we will uh, actually um, do what we did last week, which was to invite uh, those of you who are here who have a question to actually ask your question directly to the artist. Um, and so to help us do that tonight, um, I wanted to introduce um, Joanna Castro, uh, who is Noma's consultant for special projects, um, who will serve tonight as our moderator, Joanna. Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches. It's a pleasure to be here with Nidia, Martin, Michelle, and of course, Rose, and all of you beautiful people tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so again, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat, and then we'll call on you to ask your question. Uh, while people are typing, uh, Rose, I have a question. Uh, it seems that texture is something important in your work and you, you reflect it in different ways, whether it's one dimensional or two. Can you talk a, a bit about that? Um, I'm a, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, it goes to the, the hand. Texture is something that you can see, but also like it helps as I'm working to feel 
the texture of the different things that I'm working on. So like it does play a big role in, in, in how I approach my work. Um, like um, the different types of surfaces, whether it be the clay or whether it be the mylar that I used for the, for the project that I did for, um, for the Governor's Island show. Uh, it, they all present challenges, but it's like to me, they're like puzzles. And I like the idea of solving these puzzles. How do I go about in making this work? Um, so texture definitely falls into into like um, how I how I approach my work. That's yet yet like another layer of 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 my hands of what my hands are feeling while I'm making. Okay, thank you. We have have a question from Camilla. Sally, Camilla, can you raise your hand and Michelle will unmute you? Hi, Camilla. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I just, um, can you hear me? Yes, you yes. can. Okay, no, I was just interested because, you know, I, I work with, I'm on the board of the Morshimal Mansion and particularly interested in 19th century clothing and, and underclothing and the, I saw the corset forms that you have and I just was curious about your um, interest in that um, in the 19th century clothing and, and corset forms and uh, yeah. Oh my goodness like I would have been a Victorian suffragette. Uh, Victorian era is my thing. I just love the beauty of that era uh, and the clothing, it just all really appeals to me. So it's more like an aesthetic thing. It's just like, I just love that. Yeah. So that's how that, that kind of works. And then as, as a thinking of like my, um, uh, uh, my feminist art kind of thing, I look at the, um, the, the body shape and the body form as such an attractive thing that, um, it will draw your attention. So I could put my little, my little like subversive little thoughts in there. You'll, you're gonna come in, you're gonna look because of the hourglass shape is so aesthetically pleasing. But um, I'm, I hope that you take something else away from that, not just the shape. Thank you. And I believe that in the video and also in, um, in the call we had, on Tuesday, uh, you mentioned that your mom was a seamstress. So Definitely, how, do, yeah. how does that play? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah, I grew up with makers. So my dad is a carpenter. My mom was a seamstress. She was uh, actually my grandmother. She was the first to immigrate here to the States. And uh, back then, the garment industry was really buzzing about 90% of all uh, manu of, of all apparel that was uh, manufactured in the United States was here in New York City. So it was very easy for an immigrant to find work as long as they had the skill to work. So my mom came, when my mom immigrated, um, she was a, a sample maker for a designer in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the garment industry. So we grew up, me and my sisters grew up making Barbie doll dresses, making um, uh, like, we all had little miniature little toy sewing machines. So it was something that we definitely grew up. She would come home and bring us these little scrappings of, of material. Um, so it was something that we definitely, uh, we grew up with. And, and it's something that I kind of a little bit um, rebelled when I started my, uh, when I started my MFA, I decided I wasn't gonna do any kind of sewing. I was doing that for such a long time and it wasn't anything that I wanted to do. So, but I found myself in this empty space in my studio and I'm like, oh my God, now what? And my uh, sculpture professor was coming and I'm like, what do I do, what do I do? What is, and of course, what did I do? I went for fabric. And I went for my sewing machine, machine and I started putting something together, which was like, I don't want to do this. But um, it was for me a way of, of, of coming full circle and embracing that as part of my practice. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Marnie Lucas, fellow Women in the Heights um, exhibit artist. Marnie, can we find you? Morning, I miss you. I miss you too, neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> so I was. So Marnie, your question. 
Yes, well, away. this is the question that all of us artists dread, like what's next? You know, we work so hard on our present work, but um, I've followed Rose's work for a while and I just love how she thinks. And so I'm curious what new materials she's interested in trying out and new themes she's interested in working on. So I took a class and I like, I'm like so happy that I did this before this crazy, you know, everything closed down. I took a class in, um, in um, solder, soldering. Mm -hmm. I took a, a jewelry making class and particularly because I, I'm like fascinated by copper and I want to institute copper into my work. I think the, the, the recent piece that's kind of stuck in Women in the Heights and the show that hasn't really closed because the plate's <laughs> closed. Uh, that's one of my first experiment, uh, experimenting with uh, using metal in my work. So that's like, that's my next, you know, trying to um, use some, use do some metal work. Exciting. That's where I'm going. I don't know, but you know, we're going that way. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Marnie. So we went to the past, now to the future. Now back to the past a little bit. And Nydia had a great question. Nydia, do you want to ask yes. a historian? I think uh, <laughs> I see the connection there. Thank you. Yes, I was interested in hearing a little bit more about Frida Kahlo, of course. Um, uh, there is, you know, a, a Frida Kahlo mania, as, as many of us know. I'm always surprised, um, you know, and not entirely surprised. I think she's very much a forward, an artist who was forward looking. She's very much of, of our time and place, frankly. Um, and so I wonder if you, um, the connection, uh, I, I know maybe with the corsets and of course she, um, with the braces that she wore and, and the plasters that she painted, but I'm curious to hear a little bit more about Frida in your your work um, and 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 your sort of dialogue with her. Well, uh, my connection or my my sense with Frida was when um, and I haven't had the pleasure of going to see her house, but I think that one of the things when you're an, um, a first generation immigrant, I mean, it's first gen sec, when you first immigrate to this country, or when I when my parents did. The whole idea was um, melt, 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 melting pot, melt. Um, don't speak the language. I honestly did not really start speaking Spanish until these two cool little Dominican girls my age moved into my uh, um, one of our buildings, uh, the buildings next to me. And then it was important for me to speak Spanish because they were cool and I wanted to communicate with these girls. So, but it was a whole idea of like melting and forgetting, you know, like don't like, don't speak about, you know, don't speak your language. I don't want anybody to know that I'm Dominican. And so when I see, when I, when I see Frida's work, everything from the colorful home that she has to, or that she had, or to the way she dressed, there was no shame. There was just this pride of her heritage. So I kind of like embrace that and, and it's just so empowering to me, which is why this Barbie doll pissed me off so much. <laughs> but uh, so it's kind of like more that connection that it's okay that you're different and you can embrace that. And that's what I get and that's what I get from Frida. Yeah, it's um, I, if you can get uh, at some point you know, to her home, um, it's truly remarkable. Uh, you know, you can see uh, sort of um, where she slept. You know, she always said that she was her um, her best subject because she spent so much time convalescing, right. um, and so she had a mirror on you know the ceiling of her canopy bed where she would paint her own um, sort of image, right. uh, and she has these sort of painted casts um, that that are still there in her sort of old you know the home she grew up in. Um, yeah, so it's so interesting um, to think about that relationship or that connection. Yeah, yeah it was very moving. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to take a quick moment. One of the images for those who were not able to attend the opening of the women's 
and so is the piece that one of the pieces that uh, Michelle has been rotating. Um, so this is a piece I was part of the 2020 Women in the Heights creating for the future, which was um, this year's um, subtitle. Um, the and next then, question we have is, the, and, which happened to be the 10th, 10th anniversary, anniversary and yeah. the 2020 mm -hmm. and the 2020 and census. Thanks for, for that yeah, reminder. And, <laughs> and, and the, and the, yeah, the anniversary of the 19th Amendment, and yeah. you know, the, and that's an example of my. Um, and that's an example of my um, uh, metal metal smithing. The artist talk for that um, exhibit is available on the website. That was our first first virtual event. <laughs> so, thank you, Michelle. And our next question is from a current City College student, Lupe. Hi, Lupe, are you with Lupe. us? There we go. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi, so like I'm completely new to this, but I was just so inspired. I, I saw that you're from City College. I was like, oh my God, I have to come. So um, yeah, I asked that question because I'm about to graduate City College. So I just feel all this pressure and stuff. So I'd just like to hear your advice. I saw your photography on your website and I was like, wow, this is amazing. Especially the Coco Lopez, it just, I'm Dominican as well. So I'm just like, oh, that's so cool. Uh -huh. Memories. So yeah, I just want some insight. So what was your question? I didn't get it. Oh, like when you started your MFA, did you like feel any pressure? Or did you just, just like flow into your work? Um, I, I, one of the things that, that, I, that I like loved about City College is that if I would have been in one of those really high pressured schools that, you know, they'll beat you up and they'll tell you you're awful, <laughs> um, I probably would have melted and not have done anything. But I, this, the program is so small. And it's very nurturing. I mean, they do not say, oh, you're great, you're great, you're great. No, they will, they will, but it's not, it wasn't, um, it wasn't like mean, I guess is what, it, and I felt like I, this, I had a studio all to myself. It was the very first time in my life that I had the opportunity to just say, okay, I have this space, I can do anything. Oh my God, I want to feel that too. What do I want to do? <laughs> oh, me too. So, so that, that, was, that was my experience at City College. Um, the professors are amazing. Not, you know, not- Not all not, of them. Not to both. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but um, <laughs> and the program is small. So it's, it was, to me, it was, it was perfect for me. And then you kind of graduate without owing a, a ton of money, which I think is key. Oh, okay. Thank, Thank you. College. Go, go, go. Yes, go, go. <laughs> Finally graduating. I can't wait to leave. Congratulations. Oh, wait. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, um, Rose, as you uh, know, the MFA uh, final exhibit show or show perform show showcase has been part of the Uptown Art Stroll in previous years, and I believe that you were. Uh, part of it uh, a couple of years ago yeah. when you graduated. Can you tell us yeah. a bit about that? Yeah, um, I think I had, I, I think I had done the Uptown Art Stroll, the open studio the year before I started my MFA. And when I started my MFA, I'm like, hey, why don't we, or we should be part of this. So um, it, it falls kind of like when, it falls in June, so everybody's kind of gone. But we were able to hobble together a good amount of people. And those, because the studios are spaced into two, two, two different buildings. So the students that were in, in the Shep, in, in Shepherd Hall, they, whoever wanted to participate was um, uh, put their pieces in uh, Compton Gothel's Hall in, in the studio there. So it was nice. We had, man, we had like, like 40 something people come through, which was quite nice. Very, very nice. And I think it's an important connect. I personally think that no Men's City College is an important connection. So definitely. Nice. Mm -hmm. I want to read some of the really lovely comments. Uh, one from Meg Lynch, so beautifully said, and thanks. Fantastic insight into your amazing and intriguing work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Liz Ritter, I love seeing all of us in that picture. I um, mean, there's a picture from the 20 oh, yes. <laughs> opening with uh, our Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> and, yes. Yeah, that, that was a great event. Mm -hmm. And since we're looking at slides, 
Rose, can you tell us about the the baby coats? Yes. And so, about this exhibit. Yeah. So, um, um, watching the news of the uh, it, it's crazy how things just go so fast. Like time just flies. Um, watching and and this is still in the back of my head. Uh, watching the news and seeing um, uh, uh, the separation of parents from their children as they were uh, crossing the border um, into the United States um, and just seeing them with their in these cages with these um, these these mylar blankets um, just just really disturbed me and like and like I said in my in my little talk there, sometimes my work is just a way for me to like say or excise something that I feel so really upset about or um, disturbed. So um, so I went ahead and started making little uh, children's clothing out of the mylar uh, dresses. Not so much. I would, didn't really want to make a political statement as more of a humanist statement. Um, the mylar was developed by NASA for the Apollo missions. And this was a material of, um, it's a very thin sheet of plastic with um, aluminum that's kind of like um, vacuumed, infused onto it. I don't know if that's the right term, but that's what's coming to my head. <laughs> um, and it's very effective, like runners use it after a race. It is affected as it, at keeping heat in and uh with this with this project i was wondering if um uh, it could be really warm but is it comforting to a child that's been separated from their parents uh in on the border of the united states um it's kind of so the dress the, the clothing are child size a uh, child can actually wear them if the material doesn't wouldn't rip <laughs> uh but the zippers work the pullers work the snaps work um uh, it's almost more of a, the absurdity of the the absurdity of giving a child this. Um, the um, the dictionary defines a blanket as something soft made by made from a soft material, i.e., yarn or, for example, yarn. And um, I know that there's probably a lot of implications of giving these little kids in these pens something that's made out of fabric and you have to wash. But um, so, so this is probably the easy way out. And, and, and my thought is if you're gonna hold, if you're gonna have children in these spaces, is this what you give them? And um, just the crinkling of it, it's not comfortable. I, I, even runners tell me that when they're sweaty, it's like the last thing you want to feel on your skin. So it's more, it was more like a commentary on the absurdity of, um, of what's, what was, what's happening in the, in the border of the United States. I saw this amazing documentary on the Ellis Island Hospital. And regardless whether people were sent back, they were treated with so much dignity. And um, this is not, this is not how um, that I, how I feel that United States should treat people that are trying to find a, a different life here. So this was kind of like a talk on that, and a, you know, a, a dialogue on that. And uh, the picture of you with this piece was part of the 2019 Women in the Heights. Women in the Heights. That's, that's what that's creating what for change. That was the very first piece, and that kind of and they that kind of grew from that. And just like I think there are about um, twelve of them now. Yeah. And so the piece, uh, Michelle, if you can show us uh, the collection, I uh, believe that's at Governor's Island. Can you tell us about how that exhibit came about? Um, that exhibit was, uh, I applied to the Governor's Island show and, uh, I, and, and they accepted me and then I have, they give me this yucky, dirty kitchen and here I'm thinking that my cute little silver things are just going to hang on a wall, be pretty, uh, but they're, I'm um, challenged with the kitchen and, um, uh, thank goodness I have, uh, my sister and her husband that are kind of like my, uh, my like compatriots in arms when it comes to getting these things set up. 
Um, we whitewashed the place. We washed it. There's no running water. So I had to, we had to come back and forth with water to clean it up. And to me, it was a huge challenge, this um, kind of like that the, the video for this, for, this, uh, for this event was like, oh, why can't things be easy? But, um, um, but then it totally made sense. And we couldn't hang things on the wall. So I had to run these wires. And the wires just looked so like, ugh. And then I thought, well, a blanket should be out of yarn. How about if I just go up and just crochet some yarn up there and give it this effect of almost an unraveling, uh, um, an unraveling blanket of what a blanket made out of what a blanket should be made. And then um, my uh, comments were like, oh, somebody says, oh, they look like the, 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 the wires kind of, the, the, um, they look like the water of, you know, those people taking the boat across from Dominican Republic to, uh, to uh, Florida. So a lot of it was attributed. And then I got comments where um, it's in a kitchen. Of course, that's the heart of the home. That's where you, you're, you feel most nurtured. So it's like these, the space worked perfect for um, for this particular for this, for this particular exhibit. Um, the little piece that's um, the the baby um, uh, what's that called the sleeper sack um, that this that little piece there um, was um, I named it after um, uh, 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 Constantine. He was the youngest child um, a, a separa uh, that was separated from his father. I think he was three months old uh, from Romania. And uh, he was taken to a foster home from the Mexican border all the way up at, to Michigan. And um, there he had these foster parents taking care of him. And they were really beautiful because they were constantly in communication with the parents back in Romania. And um, what was really like crazy about that story was that he was, they weren't able to can reconnect him with his parents until he was a year old. So this was a second separation because as, as, as his foster parents, they flew out there to drop this child off. He was a year old and he clung to his foster parents. So it, the, the, the implications or the, or the, like the repercussions of something like this is so deep felt and so like, like, and, and, and with that in mind, I was like, how do, what do I do? How do I, how do I, how do I bring this out? How, how can I help? And, and knowing that there's like nothing I can do, but um, people that will walk through, I think one of the biggest, to me, the biggest impact, they come in, oh, this is so cute. And when I would say, yeah, this is the same material that of the blankets that are being given to the children on the board. And they were like, oh. So it's, it's kind of like the absurdity and um, not political, not this party or that party. You as a human, you decide, is this the right thing to do as, you know, as, as this great country of ours? Is this the right thing to do? So that was kind of the conviction behind that particular exhibit. Thank you. Um, that's the power of art. So it looks like we might have just two more questions. Uh, one from Sherry, and I believe the last one from Bulin. Um, so Sherry Masochi from the Manhattan Times. Oh, I just wanted to ask, um, how do you see recent events affecting your art in the future? Um. It has taken me like a while to get back into my studio and work. Um, um, yeah, it, it's it's been a it, it that has it has been a challenge to really start up something. Um, so what I have started doing is um, making things for people, making things for neighbors. Uh, and making like little decorative things, um, just as a, as a form of like, somebody said when you, when, when you have um, a creative mental block, make anything. 
So I'm kind of at the point where I'm making anything. And um, um, just a little thrown off because this is so weird. <laughs> like, um, I, I went to see my mom yesterday for, um, for like, a, just to drop her off something uh, for Mother's Day because we didn't get out there on Sunday. Um, and it just like, I, I couldn't hug her. And um, so it's just like a really bizarro, bizarro, strange thing. And I always think of, of grassroots, think of, you know, think smaller, think of the things that you can't control, being a good neighbor, um, just being gentle and being kind. I don't know. I mean, cause it's, it's bizarre. So where is my artwork going at this point? Um, I can just tell you I'm making things and, you know, I'll be giving out things and we'll see what, you know, we, we'll see where that, where that takes me. Thank you, Sherry. And Bulin, um, you have the last question. Thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge uh, the uh, people that organized this and came up with the idea to take this virtually. I'm down in Hell's Kitchen. Um, and Rose, thank you so much for inviting us into your studio. I have just started to make some videos during the time of COVID, you know, being shut in. And you did a really wonderful job telling that story and showing your work. It, was really professional and I just want to acknowledge you because your artistry seems to just you know show up in so many different forms and I loved hearing uh, the stories behind your pieces it sounded really authentic and um, heartfelt mm -hmm. I have one question and that is have you cast in any other materials? Because I've been trying to cast in resin and off clear, I mean, off clay forms recently teaching myself, but have you cast with anything else? Uh, just porcelain, porcelain, nothing. Yeah, nothing else other than some sort of clay. And, and that was another thing that was, what came about just, um, I wanna learn how to do this. So I took a class uh, at Greenwich Pottery House and um, that's where I started like really getting the cast going. Okay, well, thank you both. Uh, feel free to continue to add questions to the chat. We'll continue the conversation on social media. And now I'm handing over over the mic, the microphone to Nidia to the last part of tonight's program. Thank you, Joanna. Um, okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. those were really great questions. It was a great conversation. Um, I think we packed a lot in a little bit of art history, a little bit of New York, early New York, a little bit of immigration stories, art and process and technique. So um, that was really uh, inspiring. So thanks to all of you for your great questions. And Joanna, thanks for moderating. And Rose, of course, thanks for your questions. Um, and now we get to move on to our rapid fire question. <laughs> you look nervous. Segment. Okay. <laughs> nice. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. I think I am. <laughs> So the way this works is we'll put up some cue cards with some questions that you'll sort of, you know, answer off the cuff, 30 seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, um, just to sort of round out the evening a little bit. Um, so if you're ready, I'm ready. Go for it. <laughs> okay, here we go. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Ooh, loving family. Mm. I like that. Yes. Um, and hearing your story about visiting your mother, I can understand. Um, okay. What is your favorite place in New York City or Uptown? Hmm. I'm going to put a plug. I'm going to say the Morris Jamel Mansion. 
Nice. <laughs> All right, we get some applause for that. Great. All right. We have some seconds to that too. Okay. So this is interesting in light of your conversation um, about Frida. So I don't know if you have another answer or if that will be your answer, but um, what is your favorite artist, art work or art movement? Oh, okay. I'm going to tell you my favorite art work and it's Starry Starry Night by Vincent mm. Van Gogh. And when I first, when I first saw it at the MoMA, I cried. I mean, I've seen it over and over again, but when I, when I saw it for the first time, I'm like, so yeah. Why did you cry? What, what, were you, what moved you about uh, it? You know, we see so much artwork on, on, on co the computer or on, on uh, uh, books, and, but when you see the real thing, it's yeah. just the, I don't know, the, the connection of, Again, the physicality of it, the hands, the, the, the connection, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say for someone who talks so much about the hand, I can see where seeing the artist's hand would be. Hey, my you know. mom used to tell me all the time, I could not go into any store without touching stuff. And it's like, no, 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 it's all <laughs> no, like, my life. don't touch, don't touch. So it's like, sometimes I'm like, <laughs> but it's like I love to touch things. I didn't touch well, the painting though, but it touched me. <laughs> well, that's good, but but it's good, but it's also good you were able to channel your impulse into yeah. something, right? <laughs> okay, what historical figure do you identify with? Oh shoot, <laughs> man! Oh, that's a toughie. I'm not prepared for that one. <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm just going to throw out Amelia Earhart because I wanted to fly. Hmm. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, can, I can see that. Okay. Um, okay, so maybe, this, maybe that's your answer for this next one. Um, or maybe it's more modest. What are you most looking forward to post-quarantine? Man, I'm looking forward to going and sitting in one of my local restaurants and just having a nice mimosa or you know sangria or mojito and chilling with friends or maybe all of those in the all of those. <laughs> or all the above all right of those without having to wear a mask without having to be six feet apart yeah yeah i mean i think we can all relate okay what is on your nightstand on my nightstand, I have a glass of water, some tissue, and my, sad to say, my phone. <laughs> We're all a little guilty of that at times, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what do you consider your greatest achievement? I have two amazing boys. Mm. They nice. are my masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Okay, final question. What is your motto or your words to live by? Words, what is my motto? Oh, what is my motto? You have to live. Mm, I like that. Gotta live. Yes, you do. I think that's a perfect way um, to close out this segment. <laughs> Those are great. Um, thank you so much, Rose. This has truly been a delight, I think, for every single one of us here. Um, and thanks for all of you to joining us tonight. And thanks to Sagios and, of course, to the Department of Cultural Affairs. And Michelle has put up our poll. So if you see it on your screen, if you could take a few seconds to fill it out, um, we would really appreciate that. Um, and before we close out uh, for the evening, I want to turn it over to Martin, who has a few final things to say. Um, Martin? There you go. Thank you, Neri, and thanks everyone for joining us this evening. We want to invite you all to come back and join us next Thursday, May 21st at 7.30 for our next Stay at Home Open Studios with visual and performing artist Uniqua Simmons. And that'll be sponsored by Evident Dentistry next Thursday, May 21st at 7.30. Also next Wednesday, May 20th at 7.30, we'll have a talk on healing and community 
with curator Patricia Miranda. And last, we have a call for submissions for the Inwood Strong poster contest. Deadline is May 26th. The award, $750. And for details on that and all of our upcoming events, please visit artstroll.com. And our thanks to Michelle for posting these uh, three question survey. Please take a moment to give us your opinion. We want to hear from you. Neria, back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Uh, and again, thank you all so much. I'm really enjoying these Thursday night dates with all of you. Um, it's really, truly a pleasure and it's inspiring. And it's, isn't it, it's just wonderful to see art. Um, that's, I think, why we're, we're all here. Rose, thank you so much for uh, a really inspiring um, evening. Uh, it was lovely to, to hear about your process, to see your beautiful work. Um, and we will hopefully see you all again, same time, same place next week. Um, please fill out the survey. Um, thanks again for coming. Have a wonderful evening and good night, everybody. And thank you. <laughs>